Hello, I'm Ken Cohn at the Bloomberg Forum. We're speaking today with James Jones. He's a U.S. ambassador to Mexico. Hi, Jim. How are you doing, Ken? Okay, thanks. Uh, the peso is down about 30% versus the dollar. Uh, banks in Mexico are expecting an inflation rate of 48%, short-term interest rates of 75%. Um, first and foremost, the administration's plan to help bail out Mexico, do you think it's going to work? I think it should work. Uh, what we're dealing with right now is a situation on confidence. And if you look at the underlying economy of, of Mexico, it's very positive. As a matter of fact, they have made uh, more strides in terms of basic foundation of their economy uh, than probably any other country in the world. They've uh, had uh, surplus budgets the last two years. They had brought the inflation down from 150 to 200 percent, down to 7 percent before this currency problem hit. Uh, they have privatized over a thousand uh, industries. They have a very strong commitment to a free market system and to continue to continue to privatize um, go government-owned industries. Uh, they're moving to get private investment in infrastructure and many other things. And so the foundation of the economy is is good. And what we're needing uh, right now to make the whole program work is a sense of confidence. And I think uh, as of last week, I saw the first glimmerings that there was confidence in Mexico's future. So the program should work. Okay. Um, <clears throat> do you think that we've hit the bottom? I think uh, given the very uh, big transition that Mexico has been and is going through, there will be bumps along the road. There will be uh, great progress and then a couple of setbacks and progress. But the answer is, um, as the, the program was designed, the economic uh, program, recovery program, was designed to wring out uh, inflation and the other problems that exist uh, as rapidly as possible, which means you're going to have huge inflation in the beginning, high, very high interest rates in the beginning, but it is designed that by the middle of the year you start seeing a decline in inflation, interest rates, and what have you. And many economists whose uh, uh, opinion I respect very highly believe that this time next year, in the second quarter or first quarter of next year, uh, Mexico will begin a real uh, economic growth based on a very solid foundation. Okay. That said, there's a lot of market timers out there who've gotten burned terribly in, in their Mexican investments, and they're wondering, should I take out my money now? Should I put money in now? These people don't want to uh, wait for the, for the economists to, to forecast to come true next year. They want to know if they should put their money in now, and they're asking whether we've hit bottom. Have we hit bottom, or do you think there's more turmoil ahead? Well, I, as I say, there are going to be, uh, there are going to be uh, bumps along the road, but I think the program is in place, it looks like it's solid, and I think we ought to be able to see progress from here on out. Okay. Um, the administration has had some bumps along the road also in, in, in selling its, uh, its program to Congress, to U.S. corporations, to, to the public. Um, do you think that uh, now is the time for U.S. corporations to be resuming their, their growth plans for Mexico? I think you have to look at the Mexican economy with uh, uh, a discerning eye, so to speak. In the last month and a half, there have been another, a number of what I call contrarian investors from the United States uh, come to Mexico and see some real value, some real opportunity, and they're looking to invest direct investment, long-term investment, uh, some significant amounts over the next uh, several months, in my judgment. Any examples? Uh, it'd be in the infrastructure area, the technology area in um, uh, some areas of, of consumer type products that would be made for export both to Latin America, Asia, and Europe. Uh, so there have been a, a lot of things in, in the television area and things like that, cable TV, etc. Uh, so there is a growing interest among direct investors in Mexico. However, uh, this whole economic program will have a, a uh, it will ha it will depress consumer spending for example and so if you're looking to uh, manufacture a widget that is a consumer product it probably is not uh, the best time to be expecting uh, a high return or major sales 
but uh, if you're looking for the long term, I think that's what the contrarian investors are looking at and seeing Mexico as a good value. Okay. At the same time, some of the best and brightest of American CEOs are scaling back, or at least looking at scaling back. Walmart, for example, <coughs> biggest U.S. retailer, Citicorp, the biggest U.S. bank, both have put their expansion plans on hold. Um, what do you have to say to these big companies? Well, I think the two examples you used are, are not, uh, shouldn't be taken out of context. Both of those, uh, scaling back, dealt with consumer uh, products. In the case of Walmart, uh, it's obvious that American consumer products are going to be more expensive relative to uh, domestic, Mexican domestic-made products. And as you have a reduction or a negative growth in the economy, that's going to affect disposable income over the next year for Mexicans and obviously they're going to be spending less on the kinds of consumer goods that they would buy at a Walmart or have bought in great numbers at Walmart in the past. Walmart has a very expansive operation in Mexico and the fact that they're not going to expand further right now is, should not be taken as any unusual sign. With regard to Citicorp, basically what they have scaled back is their consumer banking uh, operations. Uh, Citicorp still has a very strong presence. I've talked to the top executives of Citicorp. They still have faith in the long-term future of Mexico. But it doesn't make sense at a time when everybody knows the economic package is going to going to hit consumers that it's not the time to expand for them into the consumer banking area. Okay. Let's talk about the public and U.S. public a little bit. Um, why should U.S. taxpayers be footing the bill, even if it's only just to provide uh, loan guarantees? Why should the U.S. taxpayer be involved? Well, I would make two comments. First of all, the loan guarantee program of the type that we're talking about at every time we've done this kind of loan guarantee in the past, the U.S. Treasury has made money. Uh, we have never had a default on this kind of loan guarantee, and I think we should not expect one in this particular case. Uh, secondly, it's in our own national interest to make sure that Mexico does not default. It's in our national interest, uh, first of all, because it's broader than Mexico. Mexico being a developing market, that we have already seen that uh, the, the house of cards could fall or the domino effect could occur uh, in Argentina and Chile and other developing markets, which are very, very important to the U.S. future. If you look at the 21st century, the most economists say the major growth, economic growth areas are in the developing countries. And that's where the United States has the greatest opportunity to expand our own economic opportunities. If Mexico, which is a very big symbol, should default, it will have a very depressing effect on the other uh, developing countries, both in Latin America as well as in Europe and in Asia. So it's in our own national interest. Uh, secondly, Mexico has tw 92 million people. 70% uh, of them are under age 30, 35 rather. Uh, more than half of them are under age 20. These are their years of their greatest energy, their greatest productivity, uh, their greatest consuming uh, years, and they are going to seek opportunities wherever those opportunities are. If they don't exist in Mexico, they will go where they are, and that's undoubtedly the United States. And we already hear the concerns about illegal migration to the United States from around the world. Uh, if Mexico were to default, and there's no hope in, in Mexico, that would be an enormous pressure on migration in the United States. So there are a whole range of reasons that uh, mean the United States has it in our own self-interest. Finally, it's a question of the new relationship with Mexico. It's been a very positive uh, experience. Uh, NAFTA, the new relationship between Canada, Mexico, and the United States. If we cannot stand up with a partner at a time when they need help, how can we expect partners around the world to stand up for us at times when we will need help? So it's very important matter of foreign and economic policy for the United States to, uh, to do everything we can, as well as protecting the taxpayers, which we're doing, uh, to make sure that uh, Mexico gets back on its feet. Okay. That's one 
part of the <coughs> equation when it comes to individuals. Let's talk about the other part of the equation, which is individual investors who have pumped money into Mexico, either directly by buying ADRs <coughs> uh, or through mutual funds that invest in Mexico. Yeah, clobbered. Uh, you said that some contrarians are going back into Mexico now. Is this a time for individual investors to be putting money into Mexican funds? Let me first of all distinguish between two types of investors. The foreign direct investors that take a very a longer range view. And those are the ones that I think are coming back into Mexico and we're seeing evidence of this. I think General Motors just uh, announced 150 million new investment in Mexico just uh, uh, the other day and others like that. The others are portfolio investors and it's true that they did get uh, hit pretty hard when this whole currency problem uh, unraveled. And, uh, and many of them are reluctant to go back in. Those who have gone back in since the problem developed have found some very good buys. For example, uh, in the telecommunications area, there have been some very good buys without naming companies where I am told some mutual funds went back in when, it, when the stock had depressed so much and it's on the rise again. So they're beginning to see some value. But once again, I think you just, you have to, as an investor or as an advisor, an investment advisor, you have to look at the total economic program, see what the results will be over the next year, and there will be winners and losers, and you have to invest accordingly. Okay. Um, but you're certainly not discouraging U.S. investors from going into Mexico. Sounds really like pretty bullish. Well, I, again, with, with the caveat that they check their stocks carefully. Uh, but when you look at, again, the foundation of Mexico and the long-range future, the elements are all there to be a great success, economic success. Will you put your money in? I'm not allowed to under this job, but the answer is there are several investments that if I were a private citizen, I would be making foreign direct investments into Mexico. Okay. Let's talk about trade for a couple minutes. Um, the, uh, for the first time in five years, there was a reversal in, in, in the trade surplus last month. Mexico actually has a trade surplus with the, U, with the U.S. Um, and my question is, isn't it in Mexico's best interest, at least for the time being, to maintain a, a weak peso and build up a surplus with us? Well, to, build, to maintain a weak peso is a policy that says we want to depress wages and we want to keep the standard of living of our people down. I can assure you this government does not want to do that. Uh, it was a very, I mean, they devalued because there was no, no alternative. Uh, they did not have enough foreign reserves left to defend the peso. Had they been there, uh, in my judgment, they would have defended the peso at the, the roughly three and a half peso to the dollar. And so everything that I get of, from this particular administration is that they want to increase the standard of living, they want to strengthen the peso, and, uh, and that they do not have a policy of deliberately keeping the peso weak, uh, because that, <clears throat> that's not where they want to take uh, their country. As far as, as um, uh, the deficit, or the, the, the now Mexican uh, surplus in February, uh, trade surplus with the United States, uh, yes, I think that there's going to be a uh, continuation of that, but that is also part of what is needed to get Mexico back on its feet. They had a $28 billion trade deficit roughly last uh, year, and under this total economic package that Mexicans have developed, that IMF has encouraged, and that our own government has, has assisted with, uh, the total package is designed to get their trade deficit down to around four, five, six billion dollars this year. When this happens, do you, as this, or as this occurs, do you think this is going to, uh, to feed the, the critics of NAFTA? I think those who voted against NAFTA in many uh, respects will always be critical of NAFTA and take every opportunity to show that something is not working. As a practical matter, uh, we will have, based upon the program, the economic program, there will be a decline in U.S. exports to Mexico. Some economists say 10 percent, some say 20 percent, and that will translate probably into a loss of some of the jobs that were created last year uh, as a result of NAFTA. However, even to take the most gloomy uh, decline in exports uh, prediction, 
uh, you will still have over 600,000 jobs in the United States directly related to, to trade with Mexico. So it's very important in this country. Okay. I think that's about all the time we have. Okay. Good to visit with you. I'm Ken Cohn. We've been at the Bloomberg Forum speaking with James Jones. He's a U.S. ambassador to Mexico. The exclusive Bloomberg Forum interview series leverages the strengths of the award-winning Bloomberg Business News and the Bloomberg Online Terminal, giving the interviewee complete information distribution, all in one place, all at one time. The interview that you've just watched is reaching financial professionals and individual investors through online electronic newswire, audio-visual multimedia reports, radio, television, magazines, and newspapers. From small growth companies to multi-billion dollar conglomerates, the Bloomberg Forum helps companies communicate with this targeted audience. The forum interview process begins with a visit to Bloomberg state-of-the-art studios, where a Bloomberg business news reporter will conduct a videotaped interview. The interview then forms the basis for an electronic print article that's distributed to all 250,000 people who subscribe to Bloomberg's core product, the Bloomberg Terminal, as well as more than 160 flagship newspapers worldwide. For those individuals who do have the use of a Bloomberg terminal, Bloomberg offers the latest in multimedia technology. The audio video from every interview are compressed and produced into a multimedia report, which is accessible on command by all Bloomberg subscribers. VHS copies of Bloomberg Forum events are also available to order. In an effort to expand Bloomberg's audience even further, Forum highlights also appear in Bloomberg Personal, a monthly personal finance supplement that's distributed to more than six million consumers through major U.S. newspapers. The publications include the well-received Bloomberg Multimedia page, which makes it possible for individual investors to call an 800 number and request specific information on a company, either in print or in audio format. To add to the benefits of print media, each month a Bloomberg Forum interview appears in Bloomberg Magazine, which reaches 250,000 sophisticated readers who consider the publication a must-read and a must-save. Why? Because Bloomberg Magazine has proved a valuable source of information for professionals in the financial market. In an ever-progressing effort to saturate the media world, the Bloomberg has carved its own niche in business television, 65 million of the nation's top investment professionals and sophisticated consumers tune into Bloomberg Business News on PBS every morning to get a head start on the day's business and economic news. Immediately following the top stories of the day, which kicks off the show, the Business Forum highlights a newsmaker interview. News from selected forum interviews are also featured on Bloomberg Information Television, a 24-hour news service available on DirecTV satellite television and various cable outlets. And market experts and portfolio managers who take part in the Bloomberg Forum will also appear on USA Network's first business program. News from those forum interviews may also be featured on Bloomberg Personal, a personal finance show that's nationally syndicated and Bloomberg Business Update that aired on the Fox Television Network. Bloomberg Forum interviews may also be heard on Info 1130 AM, an all-news New York City radio station with programming syndicated throughout the U.S., reaching 200 million listeners. And finally, as a natural supplement to the Bloomberg Forum process, Bloomberg conference centers in New York, London, Tokyo, and Hong Kong are available for analyst and shareholder meetings. Professionals worldwide can participate in meetings in person or through conference lines. To sum it up, the Bloomberg Forum is CEO interviews, market expert interviews. It's meetings with analysts and portfolio managers. It's getting information to those who can use it all in one place, all at one time. Bloomberg caters to the world's top financial and business professionals getting information to them in whatever format they need to make their important business decisions. For more information on the Bloomberg Forum, call 1-800-448-5678, extension 2085.